I grew up in the south uh, in Texas. And where I grew up in the south, we used to eat a lot of catfish. Uh, fried in all kinds of different varieties, right? Captain D's. Um, I think, you know, that was a staple for me growing up, catfish. As I ventured out into the world, I made it a point to try new things. Uh, it took a while for me, a uh, young man from Texas, to, to uh, warm up to sushi. Uh, but I love sushi now. And the same for Maryland crabs. I live in Maryland now, and uh, they're menacing looking. They're, they're disgusting creatures. Uh, and I don't know who decided that we would take these spiny crabs, and we would break them into impossibly small pieces with sharp edges and put Old Bay on it. Uh, but now that's something that I enjoy regularly with my family. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing, really. Uh, I had crabs the other day with my daughter uh, and my wife, and I marveled again at all of the uh, Old Bay and, and all the cuts. But I really love red snapper. It's such an amazing fish. Um, the problem is I read a research paper about red snapper. And it turns out that a group of researchers said that about 67% of red snapper is not red snapper. Uh, it, it turns out that it's tilapia or it's some other kind of fish. And I, I was crestfallen. I, I love red snapper. How could it not be delicious red snapper? So I did some further reading. I wanted a second opinion. And uh, it turns out that the other research that I read, it had the number much higher. They pegged it at as, as high as 90%. As, as high as 90% of red snapper, it's fake. It's not red snapper. It's something else. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like getting ripped off. And uh, I mean, ultimately, I started thinking about it. I got mad, then I was sad. I went through all the different stages of grief. And then I thought, you know, how bad could it really be? It's not like the red snapper stole my secrets. The red snapper didn't encrypt my data and hold it for ransom. Uh, it, it didn't lie in wait, waiting to wage a cyber campaign. No, it was really just overpriced fake fish. Now, in our cyber-enabled digital world, the stakes are much greater. And so I wanted to highlight some key threats and trends. And that's really what I wanted to talk to you about today. But I thought I'd start with food. We talked a little bit earlier about uh, some butchers, so I thought that was perfect. <clears throat> Cybersecurity is an ex extremely important part of the world that we live in today. It has the ability to enable our world or threaten our world and our way of life. We need to do a much better job of understanding the threats in the space and, and ultimately managing the risks to our business, to our operations, and to our way of life. Today's digital era is wholly reliant upon cyberspace for economic prosperity, digital commerce, social interactions, and even national security. Our cyber adversaries are relentless, sophisticated, and increasingly strategic. Our competitors conduct complex cyberspace operations to steal our technology, disrupt our government and corporations, challenge our democratic processes, and threaten our critical infrastructure. The environment in which we conduct our military intelligence uh, and intelligence operations is rapidly modernizing all while this is going on. Within the digital battlefield, there are tremendous needs for connectivity, enterprise services, secure platforms, and applications. What we need, what our warfighters require, are solutions that are secure, scalable, and interoperable. And an environment that is adaptable enough to accommodate new technologies while at the same time accommodating legacy technologies and enabling us to transition. And we need advanced enterprise-grade solutions that address our growing complex data sets to achieve efficiencies and economies of scale. One of the things that I really want to highlight for you are our nation's current, current threats, so I want to walk you through this. More than any other nation, the United States, our security, stability, and prosperity depend upon the availability, integrity, and authenticity of information that's transmitted, processed, and stored on our computer networks and in our infrastructure. Unfortunately, these networks and the information they carry are extremely vulnerable to exploitation and cyber attacks conducted by criminals and nation states. Nations have moved from stealing secrets 
to the realm of cyber to impose national power. They use cyber to impose their instruments of national power now. And cybersecurity is a persistent contact sport. When I was in the military, uh, you, you could move to the objective, and sometimes you would move to contact. Some moving to the objective was all about knowing where the enemy is. Sometimes in cyberspace, you don't know where the enemy is. You have to continuously hunt, and you have to seek contact. You have to root it out. To root it out, you have to go looking for it. Our adversaries have weaponized cyberspace, and we're taking a holistic look at this challenge. These nation states operate with well-funded means. We used to say that we had near-peer adversaries. We don't have near-peer adversaries. We have peer adversaries. They are relentless and persistent in nature. And attribution is, is a challenge. What we've seen our adversaries do for a period of years is operate below the threshold of war. They steal intellectual property. They steal PII or information on personnel, and they're very methodical and meticulous about how they go about doing this. They cause discord within our social ranks, and they attempt to undermine our elections and our democratic process, all below the level of war. We're facing strategic competition from many adversaries, and especially Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. The trend is clear. Our adversaries are moving from exploitation to disruption. Russia, certainly with their use of cyber in election interference, information operations, and military operations. And that you, we don't have to introduce the Russians. You know about them. But over the last two years, there have been a number of destructive attacks. Russia targeted Ukraine um, in their ongoing conflict. And they, they ended up in, impacting businesses far and wide well beyond Ukraine with WannaCry. Ponder for a moment that a significant number of maritime ports were shut down and shipping channels disrupted. They did significant damage to the just-in-time supply lines of business around the world. And a lot of our economic might, a lot of our economic growth has been based upon that just-in-time flexibility that was dramatically impacted by uh, those uh, the spread of the, those uh, compromises. There's a growing use of information operations leveraging cyber intrusions. There are cyber operations to steal U.S. intellectual property. China pursues several categories of economic aggression, including acquiring key technologies and intellectual property from other countries, including the United States. And I'll tell you, I can't, I can't say how often I've heard from folks like, oh, it's not going to happen to us. We're going to do this deal. And it's a slippery slope. Uh, in almost every case that, that we've bothered to pay attention to it, uh, it's a wicked outcome. It's a wicked outcome for uh, many of these companies and certainly for, uh, for the Western world and the United States in particular. They seek to capture emerging technologies, high technology industries that will drive future economic growth, and many advancements, of course, in the defense industry, too many to name. For China, their immense volume of cyber operations is intended to steal U.S. intellectual property and, and led to the cyber commitments that, was, that were reached during a state visit to the United States in September 2015. One thing that I really want to highlight for you uh, and, and emphasize is uh, recent operations of note, including Operation Cloud Hopper. This activity was linked to a Chinese group targeting managed service providers. Managed service providers are a very lucrative target. Actors can exploit trusted connections, compromising one company, and using credentials to move across to other trusted networks. I can't stress enough the importance of paying closer attention to the threat in this space for managed service providers. As well, the China, Chinese social credit system highlights the totalitarian nature of their efforts. They are a long-term concern with significant investment in efforts to influence standard setting in favor of state control. I'm talking about 5G and AI and beyond. They are even perpetuating a domestic legal regime 
to force disclosure of intellectual property, disadvantaging innovative countries that may want to work with China or Chinese companies or participate in Chinese markets. Regarding cyber-enabled espionage and the theft of technologies and IP, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence notes that Chinese actors are the world's most active and persistent perpetuators of economic espionage. Strategic sectors and in emerging industries have been targeted to include electronics, telecommunications, robotics, data services, pharmaceuticals, mobile phone services, satellite communications, and imagery and business application software. If you're a company, they're targeting your providers. If you're a provider, they're targeting you. So that's everyone in this room. They, they, the physical theft through es economic espionage by company insiders or others who have trusted access to trade secrets and confidential business information provides China with a significant means to acquire U.S. technologies and intellectual property. U.S. companies may be unaware of the theft by an insider before it's too late. And in part, this is because some companies are unwilling to report the theft for fear of the adverse consequences that such disclosure could entail. Even when victims report, the Chinese government is typically unwilling to cooperate, making successful cross-border intervention very difficult. China appears to be conducting a campaign of commercial espionage against U.S. companies involving human infiltration to systematically penetrate the information systems of U.S. companies to steal their data, intellectual property, devalue them, and acquire them at dramatically reduced prices. I, it's a, it's a, a pattern that we've seen time and time again. Um, China engages in widespread cyber economic campaigns involving cyber-enabled espionage to infiltrate foreign companies for the purpose of stealing intellectual property. The estimates of the cost of trade secret theft alone range between $180 billion and $540 billion annually. Now the next thing I want to talk to you about is the insider threat. I think, uh, you know, this is an area that we've been very, uh, it's very important to us in the government. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, we wanted to make sure that we shared what we could with you. Several years have passed since we uh, then since Executive Order 13587 was signed, which requires executive branches and departments, uh, branch agencies and departments with access to classified information to implement an insider threat detection and prevention program. Departments and agencies with mature, proactive insider threat programs are better postured to deter, detect, and mitigate insider threats before they reach a critical point and potentially harm national security. The agency should have a process in place for determining critical assets and assessing its risk posture as a cornerstone of this. So one thing I really want to impress upon you related to insider threat is that this, this is a program that requires more attention nationally. It isn't just within the government. Uh, you know, whether, whether it's the placement of humans uh, through an act of cyber economic espionage, or it's the theft of credentials. This is, a, this is an area that requires more attention from all of us. Some programs have experienced substantial benefit when developing close and collaborative relationships with CIOs and CISOs. The program office benefits by receiving valuable guidance about the current IT architecture, future plans, technical challenges, and solutions, and in return, the CIO can benefit by having a complete understanding of the program plan's challenges, policies, issues, and emerging threats to the department or agency's information. We believe that a number of programs stress the importance of having user attributable enterprise audit data available to the insider threat activity internally even if it is via a common SIM or data loss prevention tools. However you do it, please do it. 
Make sure that this is something that you're evaluating and working into your plans. However, we need automation to improve uh, correlation, to improve performance. This information sometimes gets directly pushed into more robust analytic tools along with other insider threat information feeds to support comprehensive analysis. This is where introducing varying levels of automation, machine learning, and artificial intelligence can provide substantial value. According to one estimate in 2017, there was a 200% increase in these types of cyber attacks, threats to the supply chain. Network management and software are potential concerns with respect to the supply chain. Last fall, CISA issued an alert about ongoing APT activity attempting to infiltrate the networks of global managed service providers. We need to start understanding and securing our software supply chain with the same rigor as our hardware supply chain. There's been a lot in the news recently about supply chain. I think it's easy to say, you know, we, there's certainly been a lot about uh, Supermicro and others related to hardware. The key is we're concerned about the hardware, that's true, but we're concerned about how the hardware can be controlled and maintained over time, particularly if manufacturers retain access and could, for example, potentially leverage an otherwise legitimate software update as an entry point to implant malware. And often overlooked in supply chain discussions is the software supply chain. Remote exploitation of large volumes of victims is possible by altering source code, compromising popular websites, or manipulating trusted apps. We saw the NotPetya malware spreading from a website required for Ukrainian business. We observed a small number of high-value targets compromised through a massive deployment of malware in the popular CCleaner app. Criminals have begun tainting open source software with crypto mining backdoors to get widespread deployment. Software exploitation carries less risk, it requires less expertise, and it scales much better than hardware exploitation. According to ODNI, the global shift in advanced information and communications technologies will increasingly test U.S. competitiveness because aspiring suppliers around the world will play a larger a role in developing new technologies and products. These technologies include 5G wireless technology, IoT, and enabling AI and big data for predictive analysis. Differences in regulatory and policy approaches to information and communications technologies and related issues can impede, could impede growth and innovation globally and for U.S. companies. Now, I think probably most of you have seen or heard about the recently signed executive order securing the information and communications technology and services supply chain. That will strengthen the security, integrity, and reliability of information and communications technology services provided and used in the United States. In addition to our efforts within the executive branch, supply chain risk is something that Congress has taken a focus on recently. For example, the FY 2018 National Defense Authorization Act prohibited any kind, any element of the federal government from using hardware, software, or services developed or provided by Kaspersky. We should expect this will continue moving forward. Which brings me back to the red snapper. Now, I'm not really sure what it tastes like. So I hope the next time you see it on a menu, you're a little more discerning. Most importantly, I hope you'll pay close attention to the provenance of the software you run and the services you buy.